Could you elaborate a bit more about the programs that children are learning for languages? Well, there are Head Start programs where people work with children to teach them in a school setting. I think the most effective way, obviously, for children to learn a language is to learn it at home, preferably from their parents, but maybe from somebody else. So there are, you know, a few children um, in these three groups that I mentioned, uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, the Miccosukees in, in Florida, um, Cherokees primarily in Oklahoma, but also North Carolina, and Choctaws in Mississippi. I don't believe there are any Choctaw children learning the language in Oklahoma, Aaron, do you think so? I don't think so. Um, and so, you know, uh, the children that are learning the language are learning it in a very good way as language acquirers at a very young age, but there's just not very many of them. Languages can be revitalized, but it's, it's a very difficult process. There are, well, I'm not an expert on, on those particular programs. Some of them do use immersion techniques, but they're all hampered by not very much funding. And, you know, for true immersion, um, you need to have basically, you know, immersion for all of the time that the child is awake. And so if a child gets the language input at home, that's true immersion. If they get it in any kind of a school setting where they're only there for a couple of hours a day, even if all they hear is the native language, it's not full immersion. Some children will acquire it, some children will not acquire it. Um, people are working very hard on these programs, um, but they are typically subject to the whims of tribal administration and whether people are able to get grants to support them, whether they can find qualified teachers. In many cases, the really qualified teachers are grandparent age and they have no teaching experience or credentials, so often these programs need to be mediated by a younger person who's not a speaker, who um, has teacher training, um, and you know, all of these people are wonderfully dedicated, but they're facing a great many problems. Um, I'd like to ask you if you know Sacking, a, a, a man called, a gentleman called Sacking. No, I don't think so. What's his first name? Uh, uh, I'm not sure. He's <laughs> really all that. Uh, I came up with him from Atlanta to here uh, at the beginning of the conference, and he uh, is apparently a match head. Oh, wow. Right. And, uh, but he doesn't know any of the language, does he? He can only speak the language. Really? Uh, well, this is absolutely wonderful news to us. I think everybody believed that Natchez was not spoken by anybody. <laughs> but this is the kind of venue at which we find out things like this. Yeah. Um, Mary Haas, who... Uh, was sort of the dean at one point of the study of Southeastern languages, worked on Natchez for many years um, in Louisiana and didn't publish a whole lot on it, but left many, many volumes of texts and other notes. And these have been being analyzed by uh, Dr. Jeffrey Kimball from Tulane. And uh, he would certainly be very pleased to meet your friend. I mean, that sounds wonderful. Uh, thanks for the song. Sure. Thanks for a very nice lecture. It was really clear and uh, really interesting. You said you uh, believe in a Southeast typology, but you were a bit skeptical about whether that's accounted for by thinking there's one source for all these languages. So I guess you think that the, all the properties came together through, through contact. The you language. know, that's, well, that's uh, a very good observation, and I had to cut out the part of my talk where I talked about aerial features. So um, indeed, um, I'm really grateful to you for giving me the opportunity to talk about this. Many people believe um, that uh, languages that are in contact often can pick up grammatical features or pronunciation features from other nearby languages because they become bilingual and they learn the other language and just something about its uh, structure intrigues them. And so we have many areas of the United States, including, I would argue, the Southeast, but um, probably most dramatically the Pacific Northwest, but other uh, areas where languages that are in contact but that are not genetically related, that don't have a common ancestor, in fact share important grammatical features. And so we would believe that those features arose due to contact. Now, um, getting back to this question of whether the languages of the Southeast have a common ancestor, uh, I was being conservative there. Um, I, I definitely 
think that I would not argue that all of the languages in Table 1 have a common ancestor, but um, I do kind of believe that there are more connections among them, such as the ones that I mentioned, uh, than you know, listing them just in, in those 13 groups with no uh, relationships at all. I was basically presenting the point of view of the uh, Smithsonian on that, which is shared by many people, although I think many of my colleagues at this conference are a little bit more open to the idea that there are probably connections among some of these languages. So in fact, some people have mentioned such connections uh, in our special section um, yesterday. So, you know, I mean, it's a very controversial issue, and you really have to go back a long, long way, and all of the evidence is a little bit chancy. Well, on that note, we need to stop so that we can get to the next session. Let's thank Dr. Mahoney.